What's up, everybody? This is episode 40 of the ClapperCast. We are on February 10th, 2020, two weeks from the trade deadline. I'm Burke. And I'm Sean. We're two weeks away, but teams are making some early moves here, Sean. So last episode, we were talking about how the Leafs might have to make a move about Freddie Anderson if he was out. And they did it immediately after that episode was dropped. Basically, so what were the Leafs? The Leafs played a game like the next day, and then within an hour of the game ending, they lost the game, by the way, because uh, Hutchinson let up a few really weird goals. Uh, <clears throat> within like an hour of the game ending, they uh, traded with Los Angeles. So they traded uh, Trevor Moore, a 2020 third round pick, and a 2021 conditional third in exchange for Jack Campbell and Kyle Clifford with 50% retained salary. So the the condition on that 2021 third is that it upgrades to a second if either Clifford resigns with Toronto or if the Leafs make the playoffs in the 2019-20 playoffs and Jack Campbell wins six regular season games. Which is so that's likely very likely going to be a second in 2021 as well, which seems like a lot now. Yeah. So what do you think about the trade? Overall, I think it's a decent one. I think the I think the Kings got important pieces for them. They're they're in a rebuilding stage right now. So obviously these draft picks are gonna be huge for them. They aren't the most ideal ones. Like they're not likely to turn into great things, but the more prospects you have in your system, the better at this time. Um then Toronto gets exactly what they need in two ways actually. They get the goalie that they've hoped will be able to actually be a reliable backup. Uh, Jack Campbell was excellent in 2018-19 with Los Angeles. He kind of took over when uh, Jonathan Quick was out and led Mm -hmm. them to being way better on the ice than they should have been. And even though he's had a rough season this year, um, you know, the the Kings, once again, aren't a very good team. So maybe a chance to go on to a better team will be a a, a good restart for for Campbell. Then -hmm. with Kyle Clifford, I mean, over the last couple of years, they've lost so much in terms of grit and physicality with like Matt Martin, Leo Komarov, and Nazem Kadri last offseason. So they get some of that back now with Kyle Clifford. Um, they seem mm-hmm. to have realized like, hey, we need some of this on the team. So here's a little bit more. Yeah, and LA's got Cal Peterson coming up. Um, so I think they've got a you know a solid prospect goalie there. So giving up Jack Campbell at this point kind of makes sense. Um, totally. And they've got Quick on the books for a number of years, so they were able to to flip Campbell for something. Um, and I agree with you. Uh, the, for the Leafs, it's a, it's a great trade. I mean, they obviously needed a goalie. Everybody kind of thought they were going after Georgiev pretty hard, but um, I don't know if there is actually any merit to that rumor. But um, if if what Kyle Dubas said is to be believed, um, this trade has actually been something they've been working on for a few weeks prior to it. It's just mm-hmm. that the talks really accelerated as soon as Anderson got injured and like threw that game basically to the point that it got completed really, really quick. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of interesting that it was nobody really pieced that trade together before it happened. Like everybody was thinking Georgiev or, you know, some random miracle trade for like Leonard or something crazy. But um, I think it makes sense. I think both teams kind of got something out of it that they need. Um, you know, the Leafs. First game with Campbell, I don't think went that great for them. I think they lost yesterday, right? Um, and the days yes. before. Um, uh, I apologize, I kind of have been out of it today. Um, but, um, you know, they obviously needed somebody to step in. And uh, with Freddie looking like he'll be out for a little bit longer, it's a, it's a definitely a great move. And the grit that Kyle Clifford adds, you know, former teammate of Muzzin, I think that's going to be, be huge for that team as well. And there was another big trade that just happened about yeah, this, this 25 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, half hour ago, basically. It's, the stove this is, is hot. A significant one. So uh, the Minnesota Wild acquired um, Alex Galchenyuk, Kalen Addison, and a t- conditional 2020 first round pick from Pittsburgh Penguins for Jason Zucker. Now, the condition on that 2020 first round pick is that if Pittsburgh misses the 2019 20 playoffs, uh, the team. Uh, Pittsburgh has the option to send their 2021 first round pick instead. So they're just, you know, kind of protecting that, that first round pick a little bit. Cause they realize like the Metro's a hot race. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They, they've got a comfortable position in the playoffs so far this year, but they want to protect it just in case things go south very quickly. So my thoughts on this is that it seems like a lot for Jason Zucker. I don't know if you agree. 
I do. I think Minnesota got an excellent package out of this. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, I think Zucker's got like 14 goals and 15 assists. Uh, just checking how many games he's played. 45 games played with 29 points. I know Minnesota's yeah. not amazing, and he has missed a little bit of time, but that seems like a lot to give up for a, a guy that's on pace for like, I don't know, what, 45 points? So the thing with Jason Zucker, too, is that um, he's always been more of a team guy. Like He's actually a pretty physically engaged, gritty forward to go along with his decent... I mean, he's a respectable second-line forward, basically, in terms of his production. But he also provides a lot of like grit, strength, physicality, and that type of play style. That doesn't really get tracked directly in those ones. And he's also spent how long with the not-very-offensive Minnesota Wild? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, so, if you take a quick peek at the Penguins' current line combinations right now, you can see why they went after him, because Galchenyuk never really found his spot in the lineup. I mean, there was that quote from uh, Jim Rutherford where he, he was saying, like, or not Jim Rutherford, wait, what the, what the fuck? I'm so out of it. Yeah, Jim Rutherford, sorry. <laughs> where he was saying that he might not even have a spot in the top 12 at one point. Yeah, and that was like within a month or two of him of him yeah. debuting in the lineup, basically. If you look at their top six right now on the the wings, uh, you've got Dominic Simone, Patrick Hornquist, Jared McCann, who's a center, and Brian Rust. Yeah. So you've got a lot of third line wingers. I want to say they're guys who they're guys who have found a good spot in Pittsburgh's lineup. They they produce higher than they probably would anywhere else, mm-hmm. but. That's not exactly, I mean, Zucker's probably going to go in there and immediately be playing on the first line, to be honest. Crosby plays with so many weird guys that you have no idea how it's going to turn out. It could be, like, unreal, or it could be just yeah, not. <laughs> but exactly, I and I it's... mean, if it doesn't work out with Zucker, he just goes and plays, or with um, Crosby, he goes and plays with Malkin instead. Yeah, basically. it's double threat. Their, their second first line. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Pittsburgh won a cup with, like, no defense, so... Anything's possible. Look, I mean, look but, how they're doing this year with the amount of injuries and random call-ups they've had to use for long portions of the season. Yeah, and they're sitting, they're sitting comfortably in second in uh, the Metro right now. Yeah, I, I still think it's a lot to give up for a, you know, second line. Yeah. So former. on that note, too, let's let's flip this and look at uh, how this works out for Minnesota. So I think this trade is pretty significant in that it it pretty much officially kickstarts the Wild's rebuild that they're finally making that trade. I mean, Zucker was like an identity piece of that team for the last six seasons. And for them to give him up as a trade deadline rental, to me, signals that the team is fully committed to their rebuild. And that is going to be the direction of the team over the next three years. That is going to be just full of overhaul, full of moving and retooling. And the, I mean, the key, the key pieces of this trade are going to, is going to be that first round pick. Absolutely. Like that's that's what they need the most, and getting, um, getting a defenseman like Kalen Addison, who's point he's a point per game in the WHL, and he was a huge part of Canada's World Junior team in 2020 at the 2020 World Junior Classic. So yeah. those are two important pieces for their rebuild: getting a defenseman that's a couple years into his development, and getting two prospect pieces on a team that has zero, well, maybe like one good prospect in uh, Kaprizov, mm-hmm. who's over in Russia right now. Um, Galchaniak, honestly, he's a throw-in. <laughs> he's a throw-in. Yeah. He's probably like a. It's probably like a taking taking cap space basically for the Penguins, so they can actually do something. Yeah, I was I was uh, thinking about that when you saw like on Instagram all of the like the TSN and Sportsnet uh, images for the trade. You know, it has like Zucker on one side and has Galchaniak on the other. It's like they should have just mm-hmm. had a number one like, first round pick on the yeah. other side instead of Galchenyuk. Gary because, Bettman standing in front of the draft board. <laughs> yeah, Galchenyuk just hasn't he's a found his project. place in yeah. any team, really. I mean, he's got 17 points on the pens this year in 45 games. For, for a guy suppo- for a guy who's as talented as he has been and was, that's like, he's, he's still got to work on a little bit. Yeah, and this is going to be his third team in as many years. Mm-hmm. I think Minnesota's kind of taking on some of these guys, these random guys in deals, <laughs> so they can get more picks. I oh, think sure. that's definitely going to be smart Why for them not? to continue it's doing. The, it's the John Chaco way, just take on random contracts and players and 
um, uh, gain gain extra picks and prospects out of it. Like it's a better way mm-hmm. to to treat cap space as an asset if you have an mm-hmm. owner who's willing to to get on board with that. Yeah, is this Bill Guerin's like first real move? I think so. How would you I don't rate recall it? them making a big one. I, I think that's a great for a great start. It's, yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, it kickstarts the new era. It's basically saying like he's here to play. He's going to he's going to make the moves that need to be made, and he's not going to get completely fleeced while doing so. Yeah, I, I think it's an A plus. It's a step in the right direction, and uh, like you said, Kalen Addison is definitely going to be uh, an important piece of this. Um, you watched him in the World Juniors. Um, he was kind of like the the, the 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 point man on Team Canada's power play. Yeah. He was he was yeah, pretty. He's got a great important. offensive mind, so that's an important an important defensive piece to to have a good one of. Yeah, he had nine yeah, points gonna... in that tournament. Exactly. In seven games, so I mean, he's he's no slouch. So I think picking no. up somebody so they can grow their prospect pool is definitely the right thing to do for them. And yeah, I and think be, it's like, I'm pretty sure huge. he's immediately their second or third best prospect. Oh, probably. So they've got, like I said, they've got Kirill Kaprizov, and I believe it's Liam Foodie is another good one. No, he's Columbus. They've got one other guy. I can't remember his name at the top of my head. Yeah, so like I said in the intro, two weeks today from the trade deadline. So I think these moves are definitely going to ramp up a bit. Um, it's interesting to see who acts early and who waits. Yes. Um, that's that's kind of the thing we've been seeing over the last few years, hasn't it? That uh, all of the the trade deadline trades are happening in like the week or two leading up to it. Get a little bit more time with the new player. Yeah, and I mean that's that's huge. I think uh, I, th- I think that the team they're going to like you don't want these trades like these guys to come in, play like five games, and then they've got all these important games coming up that they still haven't built that chemistry. You know, you're you're trading for the piece. You might as well get as much as you can out of them. Yeah, um, just uh, curious here. Do you know if Zucker's pending UFA? No, he's actually he's actually only two years into a five year contract. Yeah, he's he's signed until the end of. Uh, the 2022 23 season. So that's actually going to be a useful piece for Pittsburgh too to help uh, help prolong their cup window somehow even more. 28 year old signed to three more seasons after this. It's yep. not too bad. And that's actually a reasonable know. contract for what he provides as well, especially considering the type of deals that were handed out last summer. Well, props to the Wild. I think that's a good move for them. Mm-hmm. I think it's an okay move for Pittsburgh. But maybe let's move on to the injury front. Yes, a couple couple D men that have been hurt lately. Um, so the one that came out today was that Seth Jones of Columbus. He's the next in line to get hurt on that team, and I think this is probably going to be their biggest injury yet, by uh, far, in, in terms of importance to the team. He's he's probably their best player, to be honest. So to yeah. to lose him for indefinitely, as it's already predicted, is going to be massive. Especially they are in the middle of like a huge, huge hot streak and playoff push and they are going to miss every second of Seth Jones. Yeah, I mean he plays like what like 25 minutes a night or something. Easily. It's going to be a huge loss. Um and I don't know if they really got the depth to to accommodate that. I know they've got Zach Berensky's lighting it up offensively, but I don't know if anyone can really step in there. They definitely do not have that on paper. What they do have like this is what I I noticed um going into the season, writing their Columbus's previews, that they actually have a decent defensive core. That is one of their strengths right now. So they don't have on paper the, the star power that's going to replace Seth, Seth Jones, but they do have just defensive solid solidity. That they're probably going to be okay giving a few more minutes to a couple of guys a night to cover, that, um, to cover the loss. It's not going to be as good, but it's probably, given how the team is playing right now, um, something they rally around and can probably cover reasonably well. Yeah, because especially with got... how hot their goalie's playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's on my list here too. Uh, they've already got Dean Kukan and Ryan Murray, of course, are both hurt. Um, so you know, losing Jones is is tough, big time. Yeah. Also for Columbus, uh, Cam Atkinson. Uh, I think he's missing tonight's game. And yes. They've still got, got Josh Reaper Anderson or... again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. So they're so, missing all their best forwards. Josh too, Anderson, like guys. Dubinsky's hurt. Uh, Alexander Wenberg is hurt. 
Uh, uh, Jonas I Corposalo. I think he's coming back, but um, you kind of alluded to it a little bit. Uh, their goaltender, Elvis Merzlikens, yeah. is just hot, hot, hot. So I don't even know if Corposalo would, would get that many starts when he comes back. Cause yeah, he's probably Elvis lost is... the starter role to this point. <laughs> Elvis is making a huge case for the Calder for himself. He won't win because he hasn't played enough games, but holy crap, is he building like a, a nice highlight reel early on, right? Absolutely, yeah. He's got five shutouts, so that's that's pretty wild. And what? How many how many starts does he have? Like ten? He's played in twenty five. I'm not sure if the, how many of those are starts. Okay. But uh, yeah, um, and then Mark Giordano of Calgary. He. Uh, Took a weird shot, like he one timed a shot, and uh, his ankle went a weird direction. And he's he's been out for Calgary, so he's you know a huge part of that team. So uh, losing him has definitely hurt them. They're doing pretty uh, struggling in the last last ten games here. <laughs> They're sitting four, five, and one. Uh, they've kind of fallen down to the third wild or to the second wild card spot. Pardon me, and they're one point ahead of Arizona for losing that spot. So. That's going to be a huge loss to have your captain and best defenseman gone for any amount of time at this point. Same yeah. situation as Columbus, basically. Hamannick, he left their last game too, so I'm not sure if he uh, if he's hurt um, or not. But I know we'll I was watching their last game, one. and he, he had to leave the game and didn't come back. So that'd be rough to lose, you know, two a six. But uh... So that's kind of the point oh, of the year uh, that we're in. Hamilton or Hamilton. Um, Hamannick is going on IR. Ouch. So he's he's out for a week at least. Uh, that's rough. So that's going to be hard for them. I don't think they quite have the defensive depth as uh, Columbus does. Mm-hmm. They're going to have. Um, I think uh, they're going to look be looking really really hard on Rasmus Anderson to step up yet again. In, yeah, I think uh, he's got absences. the potential, but he does. The pressure's on now. Big big time. Uh, speaking of Alberta team D men, one was recently signed. So I'll let you uh, speak about that. Yeah. So the Oilers um, talks between him, between the team and Darnell Nurse, heated up big time uh, yesterday and today. So it was officially announced that he has resigned for two years at 5.6 million per year. So basically, what this is, um, even it, it, the two years takes him to his first UFA season, and the team basically gave him a good faith deal that he's going to take a shorter term and a lower cap hit now with the intention of negotiating a longer term, higher cap hit deal in two years once the Oilers have some of their cap troubles from Chiarelli off the books. So by that point, they're going to have guys like Chris Russell and a couple of buyouts out. That'll free up the two or three million that Nurse is probably going to be asking for at that point. Yeah, he um, he would be brought into UFA by this deal as well yes um, so definitely he'll, he'll be looking to uh, cash in uh, at that point and yeah i mean it so, seems like so an okay in terms deal. of yeah it, it, it's an okay deal it's not um I'm, I'm glad that it's not the six or seven that everyone was projecting or predicting and i'm glad it's not the eight that nurse was asking for <laughs> yeah that's so, uh, kind of ridiculous to be completely honest he is not a great defenseman he doesn't I've been I've been waiting over these last two seasons for him to develop the defensive IQ and just aptitude around playing the position. But he still hasn't completely figured it out and he is very very prone to making massive mistakes with the puck. Um like he regularly has twice as many recorded giveaways as takeaways. He's constantly losing the puck. Um one play in particular even though he is a defenseman who is not afraid to jump up in the rush, his only play offensively is a random slap shot from the point or like he did a couple of games ago where he skated into the zone, cut into the slot. And then he was at like the, the, the hash marks basically. And then he turned around and passed it to a guy who's like at the top of the circle, but mm-hmm. there's two opposing players in that passing lane already. So it just got picked off and went the other way immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, it's little plays like that, that really make me not want to give him a huge deal. Um, he's also really, really prone to, um, in, in one-on-one coverage in the defensive zone, he is really prone to taking penalties, usually a hold or a hook, that he seems to just get to get mentally beat, so he resorts to using his strength that he then takes a penalty on. He's really prone for that. So 
that's one of the things that he really needs to work on. But on that note, one of something that he really provides is that he is a strong and physically engaged defenseman. That he's not he's not afraid to drop the gloves. He throws hits constantly, and yeah, he's a monster. Exactly. So he he can be a really really useful second pairing defenseman if he's playing with a really good two way guy. But uh, he's he's not the defensive stalwart or top pairing defenseman that's maybe you would expect out of a fifth overall pick. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's I think it's an okay deal. <laughs> I think you put it a lot more eloquently than I could have, but uh, that's that sums it up. I think just a it's an okay deal for an okay D man who was mm-hmm. asking for a lot more. This also, I might add, makes him the highest paid Oilers defenseman as of next season. Really? How much does Clefbaum make? Yep. Four point four. He's more than Clefbaum. <laughs> yeah, no, Clefbaum got signed to an amazing deal that takes him for a few more years yet. Wow. Actually, that no, Clefbaum's four point one. Wow. Yeah. So that's absurd. <laughs> Clefbaum, like he he signed this incredible value deal years back. I think he must have given like everyone knew he was going to be pretty good as long as he stayed healthy. So he must have really wanted that term and was willing to to sacrifice a lot in cap it for that. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for major injuries um, or, or signings, but uh, I did have some, some, Oh, I don't know what to call it, but this week's like top performers or at least individual efforts. Um, I had a bit of a sore spot here, but Mark Stone had a five point night while we had him on our fantasy bench. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah yeah so what you know he he kind of had a slower few games and i think they were playing florida that night yes and i was like oh yeah we'll we'll put him on the bench and let's give like i think we picked up yamamoto for a game or two just because he had been hot so picked up yeah, picked up him and left uh left stone on the bench for the game just because stone hadn't been as productive in our in our league in the last few Instant so yeah you know fucking three special team points and instant regret yeah, but hell of a game for him. Just for sure. went beast mode. We talked about Elvis. He had back-to-back shutouts. One has a bit of an asterisk next to it because it was an AHL team. Uh, it was the Detroit Red Wings, and he only made 16 saves. But still, you know, a shutout's a shutout. A back-to-back, pretty impressive. Who only plays two periods, is it a shutout? <laughs> 16 shots. Yeah, um, yeah. Man. Had a little bit of a boring game, but you know, still, I mean, Detroit just beat Boston, so it's not like they're that bad. But or still, is Boston really as good as we think they are. <laughs> 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 Which ways to go here? Yeah, um, and then Mackenzie Blackwood also had back-to-back shutouts, including one that had like 46 saves or something crazy like that. Yes, so he did. very impressive for him, especially considering the the defense that's uh, in front of him. Big time. That's that's a huge uh, accomplishment for uh, yeah, definitely. for a New Jersey Devils team. I, I just wanted to point out on the note of Blackwood, how just how much better the the New Jersey Devils are with him in the lineup. So this is this goes back a couple of a couple of games. So the the numbers were a tiny bit off here, but um, in games where Blackwood plays, the Devils have a 16, 15, and seven record. So that's an 84 point pace which is not playoff worthy, but considering the lineup that they have and what they've been actually performing as, it's not terrible. In the games where Blackwood does not play, and this is entire, like all of the games that he has not made an appearance, I'm counting um, games where he comes on in relief in his own record. The Devils have a 3-9-3 and record, which is a 49-point pace, which <laughs> puts them in competition with Detroit. Yeah, so wow. you're looking at, that's like a 35-point difference just with this one goalie on a very bad roster yeah that's so a i think huge uh, swing. yeah i wanted to uh, you know spe- specifically point out that Mackenzie blackwood is probably one of the league's better goalies at this point and uh mm-hmm. he would probably be getting a lot more recognition if he weren't playing for new jersey <laughs> garbage team yeah he really is where's wayne gretzky when he's making those organization comments <laughs> he is just super important to that team um and then my Last team, or my last monster performer, was the Winnipeg Jets. Put a whole team on there. They had a, they've had a, they're on a three-game win streak, and they're back in a playoff spot. 
and the last podcast I was kind of shooting on them and I didn't know if they had a chance and what do you know they just have like a huge huge week <laughs> where they just they heard you they heard you they, they subverted my expectations they've just <laughs> had a great week and they're back in it and you know it's kind of like I think they could be a real dark horse for the cup just on the mentality of you know all the adversity that they've struggled oh, totally with if they get into season. the playoffs on like a uh, every game is important note when they're they've got the momentum swing no they're they're the underdogs no one's going to expect anything of them so why not have them be be this team that's just going to like pesky pesky sends their way through the playoffs and make, yeah. make noise i think i think that they're my dark horse pick now just based on how their season's gone they're kind of on paper they shouldn't be where they are based yeah. on their defense they've had some players step up and i think if they can get dustin bufflin's cap space back and they get a few key pieces at the deadline i think they'll they're going to be a real force to be reckoned with in the central i think uh, i think patrick line just 360 no scope you yeah all power all in the power play too yeah Yeah. so i i think they've just had a huge week and it's kind of cool to see um and I was talking to somebody about this at work that it'd be really funny if the Jets made playoffs and Toronto didn't. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Just on so, you know the expectations for the season and how good the team is and on mm-hmm. paper. It'd be yeah, unreal. yeah, no, totally. That'd be that'd be a great story to be honest. To have all of this turmoil on your defense to the point where you have like one or two guys who had played in the NHL in the last last season, one yeah. one returning defenseman or something to make the playoffs off of that. So yeah. you mentioned that they might be big players at the deadline if um, if they can get Bufflin's cap hit off the books. Who do you think are some main targets? Who do you think they're going to want to look for? Uh, I think Sammy Vatanen would be a huge addition to that team. I know Pionk has been playing on their power play. Uh, I think Pionk's a right-handed D-man, um, but vatnan has got a bomb. I think he would be a huge upgrade on the power play for them. Mm-hmm. Um I think people have been kind of toying around with uh, the name Rastus, Rasmus Ristolainen. Um, You know, at the beginning of the season, or in the off season, there was kind of rumors that he wanted to get out of there. I think he might have actually requested a trade, but then... I think he when, quietly uh, kind of did, yeah. When, uh, what's his name, the coach? Ralph Kruger. When he came in, he was so impressed by him that he wanted to stay. Um, but I think just the way that their season is going if, if he wants out <laughs> i wouldn't blame him no and i think maybe G- gm jack eichel might do that for him and i think alec martinez might I be just, i target. just wanted to throw alec martinez's name in there he's he's still got one more year left on his contract after this one so that's going to be a nice uh bonus if they can manage to land him but uh martinez who i who uh he's already scored a cup winning goal actually oh yeah. Um I think he's he's a really solid defensive defenseman and that he's someone that can really help um he's got that physical presence that'll help solidify a playoff team playing playoff hockey as well as significant experience in the playoffs with Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So for a team like Winnipeg that's they've been able to get deep one year but they haven't been able to really make the push they they kind of got beat out that one year by Vegas but um having Martinez on their team would be a huge huge boost their veteran core veteran leadership there yeah i think that would be a a good move for them too and you know if if buffs contract comes off the books they're going to have a lot of money to play with because of the way the contract works throughout the season you know that that contract's more valuable later in the year um, because there's only so many games left so if they get that off the books that's going to be huge for them they could get a couple huge pieces to the team for sure I don't think they'd want to fuck with it too much because they might lose what makes them so great. But if they can be smart about it and get people come in and don't change the team mentality and just can just slot in, I think they can yeah. really make an improvement on the team and yeah. come in and it's a big surprise. Kind of Yeah. You make you I make mean, a good point about like they've their roster on paper is the most impressive, but it's doing really well on the ice. And that's that's something like you don't want to toy with too much. So I think that's a good point. That uh, they probably don't want to make too too many moves or bring in too much of a different type of player, and they're going to need to be careful to 
-hmm. find someone that'll actually fit in with a coach's system. Yeah, and they've been making some deep runs too in playoffs. They've got some experience with the guys who are already there. They can mm-hmm. get some more guys who can make a huge impact. I think they'd, that'd be a wise move. Um, they, they've still got players like uh, Mark Shifley <laughs> and and Mark Wheeler. <laughs> Mark, my yeah. name is Blake <laughs> Mark Wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they've got Line A. They've got Cal Connor. You know, they've they've got a lot of good forwards. So I think. If they can improve that D line, they they'd be in a good spot. Um, did you have any other outstanding performances of the week that you wanted to mention? How about Alex Ovechkin's week or Ooh. two weeks? I guess we should say. Yeah. This one, I, uh, this one, I'm surprised you didn't have him on your on your list. But uh, <laughs> I mean, the last couple of weeks for Ovechkin, what's he ha- what he had like 15 goals in 10 games or something? Seven. Seven I think games. He had, no, he had 14 goals in seven games. Something like that. Yeah. To the point points. that he had. He had outscored. He had he had more goals than anyone else had points over over that same span of games. Yeah, I think which it was is like, absolutely impressive. It's like a two week period. He had more points than anybody else. Now, he had more goals than anybody else in the league, except for Kucherov. Yeah, had points. So, yeah, fuck, I fucked that up, but you get the idea. <laughs> he had a lot of points. Points okay? have been made. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that's one of the hottest stretches, one of, if not the hottest stretch of his career. And he's doing it now. And it's basically put him back right in with the Rocket Richard that he's up there with Pasternak and Matthews at this point. They're, they're duking it out for the Rocket Richard trophy again. Yeah. And I mean, he's, he's cooled off now. He hasn't had a goal in two games, I think. He can very but... easily have a hat trick at any time. <laughs> exactly. I mean, he, what, he went and had a hat trick in six minutes against LA few games back so yeah he was held without a <laughs> shot for the first like 54 minutes of that game and then he had a hat trick yeah it's just you never know <laughs> so yeah don't don't want to forget that 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 performance because uh for for him to be doing that especially as he's now sitting at 698 goals i'm kind of mm-hmm. sitting here waiting i'm watching every game at this point i just want to see him hit 700 yeah it's exciting the chase to 700 and beyond he'll, he'll get Did there you see um the the NBC channel today was supposed to be showing Tampa Bay and Columbus their first rematch since last year's playoffs, yeah. but they yeah, switched bumped. within the last couple of days to show the Caps game instead. Yep. In the the quest for seven hundred, and there were there were some fans that were pretty peeved off about that. Yeah, it was the, the game between Columbus and the Lightning since the the sweep. Kind of upsetting, but I get it because Ovechkin probably brings in more people. Well, it's it's also like the historic quest for it. Like, yeah, it's a huge moment. It's it's kind of one of those ones that you want to, you want to be seen. Like people around the league want to see, because it's not, you know, Columbus and Tampa play four or five times a season, or three or four times a season. Ovechkin hits seven hundred goals once. You want that in on as many TVs as possible. Yeah, like if he had got two goals tonight and hit seven hundred, and they didn't have it on, people would be upset. Yes. I think they'd, they'd be more upset than just missing a normal season game against yeah. or between Columbus and Tampa. Which, like, let's be honest, like, they're a TV station. They need to they need to make their viewership as widespread as possible. Mm-hmm. So Tampa-Columbus isn't exactly the game to do that. <laughs> yeah. Outside of the Tampa and Columbus fan bases. Which, by the way, they did still show the game in those teams' viewing regions. I don't know how, like, big they are geographically yep. but you know where the but where a lot of the fans are going to be still got to watch the game so i mean that's fair i think um speaking of tampa just real quick here tampa is in their last 21 games 18 2 and 1 there's the tampa we all knew yeah they were hiding but they've been there all along so yeah they have kind of snuck into i think they're third now in the conference in the east yes they are two points behind washington at this point yeah so they've won six straight (laughs) they're uh man they've came up of the the bottom and now they're here (laughs) it was a slow start for them but they always had games in hand and now now they're at the top exactly yeah and this is this is exactly what we kind of expected i was i was more surprised that they were that they were spending as long as they did down at the bottom of the standings actually 
because that that lasted a solid 15 20 games i think that they were they were struggling big time like that and it took a while before they started to put it back together yeah yeah i think vasilevsky is really returned to form lately he's he's been huge for them and he kind of he didn't suck but he wasn't his normal self at the beginning of the season so having him return back to being a beast is pretty big for them big time yeah and we should mention now that there is a bit of an olympic update this is an important one this is something that we've we've talked about quite a few times on here because yes. both of us both of us want to see this happening again. So you go ahead with the Olympic update. So it was the IIHF came out and said that uh, they would be supportive of, um, what was it, covering the insurance? I don't have it written down here. Yeah, uh, it was covering help me out here. insurance and travel costs. Right. Um, and the ability for the NHL to promote on their own platforms. So, right. so the, the NHL can points. use, exactly, you, the NHL can use like Olympic videos or um, signage or logos or whatever on their own platforms. Yeah, so huge. I think that's a huge step in the right direction. It's a major concession. Um, I think it, it, it's to the benefit of both parties to have it happen because you know for the Olympics, it's going to be such a huge draw. They must have seen a huge drop-off in viewership the last Olympics. I know I don't, didn't watch very many games because it was just the Olympic yeah. athletes from Russia show. And it's, yeah, I didn't, I, <laughs> honestly, I don't think I watched a single game. I kept up with like the standings and like who won and stuff, but I didn't pay attention to anything. Yeah. Me neither. It was, I watched the women's hockey though. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. The, the pens was just a lot of former NHLers on team Canada. Team, Ca- team Canada was like a handful of Oilers who couldn't make any other team in the league. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really was the Edmonton Oilers. Alumni I show. Cast offs, but rude. <laughs> That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, but uh, yeah. So I mean, it'll it'll be huge if they can make it happen because you know everybody wants to see Crosby yeah. and McDavid and McKinnon. And <laughs> oh man, can you together. imagine them just rolling that out as a line for for a shift just for the hell of it? <laughs> Holy shit! Maybe that's why they're they're holding off because they just know Canada would just destroy. Oh man. Okay, so here's the here's here's my big point that why it's going to be so so good for the league is that the NHL is so keen lately on boosting international their international presence. They're doing all these games in Europe and these games in China. They want to get these areas to follow the NHL, similar to how the NBA is taken over and um, taken off in China. Mm-hmm. And for them to not allow the best players in the world. Their, their players, the NHL players, to participate in the international tournament that's going to put them on the soil of the markets that they want to promote in is a huge, huge loss for, for what they're trying to do yeah. on, on a platform. Because the Olympics may not be as big of a thing in North America because, because we have so many other professional sports leagues. But in other areas in the world, like in Europe and Africa, the, the Olympics are huge. This yeah. is kind of like the, the premier sporting event for a lot of places around the world. So... Mm a lot of people follow it way more than they ever would here. So like the NHL is missing out on a huge thing, a huge marketing opportunity by not having their players there, the best in the world. Yeah, absolutely. The the IOC is also missing out on having the best players in the world participate in their tournament. And it really cuts down on their, um, their promotability and their viewership. Yeah. I wonder if the NHL is wanting like, you know, like during the games, if, if um, say like you have like, I'm just picturing like Connor McDavid on the bench in like a Team Canada jersey. If they want like a close up of McDavid and it says like this is McDavid, he plays on like the Edmonton Oilers in the NHL, something like that. So people like know where to like they can follow them or something like that. Like I wonder if that's something that the NHL would want to associate their brand with this player. That this could on be nice performance. So that, you know, people are like, Oh, where can I see more of this? Oh, the NHL, what's that? Oh, you know. I feel like that particular thing might be a bit of a touchy subject for the Olympics because they seem to have their own very, yeah, their own official like, um, yeah, their own say like, like imagery or interface graphics and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that would that would be a great way to to roll with that, where it's like, hey, this you know, or have like little segments on players. Like, obviously, like they're gonna have to work on it on the international broadcasts. Because like you don't need to tell like Canadian hockey fans who Connor McDavid is. Yeah, who is but, this um, David guy? Yeah, <laughs> who's this um, David McConnor fellow? 
but uh, that could be a great way for the league on international broadcasts to promote, you know, their own pro their own product. For sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped that there's some good news. Yeah, because it's been a I'm lot excited. of bad news lately for that, and it's it's cool to finally have like light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, that's pretty much everything that I had, Sean. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to go over. I think that about wraps things up for uh, this week here on ClapperCast. So to help spread the word of ClapperCast, make sure to share us around with your family and friends. If you want to keep up to date with any content we put out or just our general thoughts and updates throughout the week, uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram or Facebook at ClapperCast Media or on Twitter at ClapperCast. So thank you all for tuning in, and we will be back next week for more hockey coverage.